All right, Coleman. And I wonder if you'd uh, get us started by uh, saying a little bit about what happened and uh, what your problem is with what happened. Basically, uh, Ted invited me to give a talk about my upcoming book. And by Ted invited me, I mean Chris Anderson, the head of Ted, invited me. And, and to be clear, my Ted talk was about colorblindness. It was arguing that we should try our best to treat people without regard to race, both in our personal lives and in our public policy. He brought me in to give a TED talk, knowing that it would ruffle some feathers, but seeing it as an opportunity to begin to fix the issue of TED's ideological conformity. And I thought, this is great. This is uh, you know an opportunity to help TED by bringing my perspective. And I have the cosign of the boss. I, I assume that it won't you know, blow up in, in my face in any way. So I give my TED talk in April. Out of the corner of my eye, I could see just a few people that were upset, but really just a handful in a crowd of almost 2,000. The rest of the conference, I made a point of, you know, showing my face and trying to actually find the people that were upset and talk to them. And I was able to find one woman that was extremely upset with me. And we had a conversation and actually hugged at the end of the conversation, though I, I found later that she was just as mad at me. So I, I guess whatever I did didn't work permanently. So the day after my talk, I get an email from Chris saying that a group called Black at Ted would like to speak with you. Or, or actually, to be more precise, would you be willing to speak with this group Black at Ted? There are some hurt feelings and maybe if we get you in a room together, this can all be resolved. So I said, sure, happy to speak to them. And then I got an email right after that saying, actually, I don't think they're willing to speak with you. And Black at Ted is an employee resource group at Ted that creates kind of a safe space for Black employees. After I get home from the TED conference, a few weeks later, I get an email from Chris saying, there's major blowback to your talk and people are saying that we should not post it at all. I hadn't actually considered that it might not get posted at all until that point. In the same email, he sends me a meta-analysis, which he said he got from a social scientist friend, which showed my talk to be inaccurate. At this point, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, are they preparing the grounds to censor my talk uh, using fact-checking as a pretense, even though it passed the fact-checking team? You know, every word of a TED Talk gets fact-checked before it gets spoken, and you don't deviate from the script at all, and, and I didn't. So I looked at the meta-analysis, and... Right in the abstract, it said colorblindness is negatively correlated with stereotyping and negatively correlated with prejudice, uh, not correlated either way uh, with discrimination. And the only negative finding was that it's negatively correlated with supporting DEI policies. Yes, you heard that correctly. The, the negative finding about colorblindness was that it leads people not to support policies like affirmative action and permissive Im immigration. That's how the paper defined it, which I thought was circular. Obviously, colorblindness leads people not to support race-based affirmative action. That's, you know, that's definitional. The interesting question would be, does a policy like affirmative action have negative or, or positive effects? So, so the meta-analysis made no sense as a refutation of my talk. And I pointed that out to Chris and he accepted that answer at the time happily. And what followed was, uh, you know, over the course of a few weeks, Ted pushed me to try to adopt these strange atypical release strategies. So first they wanted me to participate in a debate and attach the debate to the talk as one entity. And I, I didn't agree to that because I said, look, happy to debate. It's a separate thing, but I believe my TED Talk, like every other, should stand on its own as an independent product. The right? smugness of these people, that they would actually think that that made sense because the issue is structural racism, that it's an exception. The smugness of them. Have they no decency, sir? I, God, that gets my bander up. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah. Well, yeah. well I have a question, sure. which is Chris Anderson is not, beholden, is he, to a group of employees who are undoubtedly a minority of all of his employees For some who reason, happen to have a beef, why can't he just tell them, not this time? I've never understood that. That is a fantastic question, Glenn. <laughs> and I don't have the answer. I mean, he, 
He, would he doesn't think want to be called a racist. He's, he, he would consider it a hideous thing to be tarred as a racist on social media, even if the number of employees who had a problem with your talk, which I suspect it was, was about three and a half. But to him, you can't be tarred as a racist. Next, they had the idea of, okay, let's, let's do a debate and release a TED Talk at the same time on the same day. And I said, no, I, I think you should just release the TED Talk normally, not held hostage to any debate. And, and one, one reason for this was because I've had people back out of debates in the past. You know, you, I think you both know how tough it can be to get debate partners on this topic. So I thought, you know, there's no guarantee this debate will even happen at all. Right. So why, how can I hold my talk hostage to a debate that I don't even know if it will you know, successfully be planned? The, the compromise we came to was that they'd release the talk and then two weeks later, they would release this debate. And that was not ideal to me, but I agreed with the compromise and I, I figured that's okay. That's what we'll do. They released the talk. Two weeks later, they released the debate. Uh, which was with Jamel Bowie. In my mind, I, I had washed my hands of it. Then Tim Urban, who is a, a blogger and who was actually given the most viewed TED Talk of all time on YouTube and uh, a, a quite a famous person within the TED community, he tweets that he believes TED is deliberately under-promoting my TED Talk because it has an implausibly low number of views relative to every other talk. You know, the way these TED Talks work and are promoted, literally all of them get about half a million views on TED's website baseline. After Tim tweeted that, I checked to see if he was right. And if you look at the five talks released right around mine to hold time, time constant, they, had, they all had between 450,000 views and like 800,000 views. That was the full range and mine had 73,000 views. So it had 16% of the least, uh, the, the low range of the TED Talks released around my time. And you're probably one of the best known of those five people also. Correct. Correct. Mm -hmm. They have a podcast called TED Talks Daily, where they repost every talk as an audio podcast. They didn't do that for mine. In fact, they didn't even repost my talk to YouTube, which is pretty much done automatically. And until somebody noticed and said, why have you skipped posting Coleman's talk to YouTube? And I, I reached out to them and, and then they did it. So when I found that out, I got mad and I felt that they had reneged on their side of the bargain. Many weeks later, Barry Weiss just got wind of this story somehow. So she reached out to me for, for the story in the free press. And I felt at this point it was justified to go public because they had reneged on their end of the, uh, their end of the bargain and I had acted in good faith throughout. Um, so I, I wrote up this whole story for the free press. And it, you know, it went fairly Twitter viral in, in our kind of spaces. Ted ended up looking quite bad. And then more people ended up seeing my talk than would have ever seen it if they had just promoted it normally. So this is a classic, uh, what they call the Barbara, Barbara Streisand effect, where you try to suppress something and then it ends up actually amplifying it. So have you reached closure with uh, Chris Anderson and the, the TED organization or y'all still mad at each other? I mean, look, I, <laughs> I, I posted a, they posted a response and then I posted a response and that's where I've left it. I don't think that either Chris or Adam Grant has really issued the kinds of apologies or retractions or acknowledgements that would be merited. In this situation, in other words, Chris has not acknowledged that they deliberately didn't promote the talk. Chris and is a great me, guy, but he wrote that message of his is just it's boilerplate. He he very artfully said nothing. I was I was surprised, yeah. honestly. Yes, I agree. He's a, he's a nice guy and has been very civil throughout the whole process. And we're still on speaking terms, so we're not we're not any kind of bitter enemies. But um, I, I do feel at a base level, interpersonally, even privately, you should acknowledge the thing that was done or, or deny it and call me wrong. You can't just not address it, in my view. It shows you the, the reign of terror of this kind of ideology that it would force someone like him into behaving that way.